WillNisley.com. Will Nisley. Hey, I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10, and Fridays are awesome unless you're in the U.S. Northeast and you hate snow. The region's dealing with the effects of what could be the most significant storm of this winter. When a snow emergency is declared in places like Boston, Massachusetts, you know the weather's bad. Blizzard conditions, whiteouts, more than 1,600 flight cancellations, the closure of the largest school district in the United States, and warnings to people not to leave their homes except in an emergency. This is all because of a storm system that's affected more than 60 million people in some way. That's roughly one-fifth of America's population. It came on suddenly. Wednesday's temperature at New York's John F. Kennedy International Airport was 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Yesterday, it was 25, sinking to a low of 18 overnight. And it came with snow. Forecasters predicted 8 to 12 inches in New York with wind gusts of 50 miles per hour. Boston was expected to get 12 to 15 inches of snow. And yesterday in Massachusetts and Connecticut, thunder snow. Pretty unusual event when a winter snowfall brings the thunder. The system was moving out of New York by last night, but it was expected to impact Boston through the weekend. The National Weather Service doesn't expect the temperature there to get above freezing until Sunday. Despite the storm's location, though, and despite its effects, it moved from west to east, from land to sea. It's not technically a nor'easter, though some folks were calling it that. What exactly is the difference? A nor'easter occurs within the most crowded coastline of the United States, the Northeast, and they can occur any time of year but are most common between the months of September and April. That's when weather conditions are prime for a nor'easter. You start with a low. It's going to travel from the southeast to the northeast and intensify. Nor'easters are strongest around New England as well as the Canadian Maritime Provinces. Now we have very warm water in the Gulf of Mexico and all around the coast of Florida. It's going to warm the air above it and that warm air is going to clash with very cold air coming in from the north. Now nor'easters carry winds out of the northeast at about 58 miles per hour or more. And keep in mind, the wind direction out of the northeast is what defines a nor'easter. It's also going to cause beach erosion as well as coastal flooding in very, very rough ocean conditions. Now not all nor'easters have snow, but some of the most memorable ones have dumped lots of it. Feeding a growing population, the price and availability of land, government rules and regulations, international trade laws. These are a few of the challenges faced by farmers worldwide. And they're on top of the everyday demands of producing a successful crop and making a living from it. They have a new tool that can help though, crowdsourcing. Getting information, usually through the internet, from other farmers who've faced and overcome specific problems. What about those farmers who don't have internet access? What if you could stop global food shortages with this? 70% of the world's food comes from small isolated farms that are on average only two acres, about 0.8 hectares, like Daryl's farm in Kenya. If farmers like Daryl didn't produce food, the world wouldn't eat. So what happens when Daryl, who's only been farming for a few years, finds out his crop is mysteriously dying? There came a disease. It came from nowhere, and nobody knew about it. That's where an emerging social network that connects rural farmers with no internet access comes in. We Farm, a London-based startup that's recently raised $1.6 million in seed funding, works on a simple premise. Have a problem? Send a text that goes out to 120,000 other farmers and crowdsource the answer. That's exactly what Daryl did when worms got into his tomato crop. Luckily, whoever got that question it is uh, like God eh? <laughs> who worked there. He gave an answer as if uh, he was in my mind. The solution? A pesticide that killed the worms and saved his tomatoes. At its roots, farming is about generational knowledge. Your mom was a farmer and her dad was a farmer and so on. But in millions of small isolated farms, that knowledge only goes as far as you can walk. 
Now, these farmers have a global community to lean on. Our first function is to connect all the farmers uh, and ensure that they're able to tap into this generational knowledge. The network has already answered over 280,000 questions and shared 18 million pieces of information. So it's not just about sharing the challenges that they're having, they're also sharing the, the wins that they get on a day-to-day -day basis. Basically, the more successful the farmer, the more land he can buy, and the more crops he can grow for the world. The farming, it's in my blood. Hopefully, I think it, it, it's gonna take me somewhere. Coming Monday, full coverage of a U.S. federal appeals court ruling concerning President Donald Trump's executive order on refugees and immigrants. We'll bring you a complete explanation and reactions from both sides on CNN 10. 10 second trivia. Research into the structure of DNA made which scientist famous? Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla, Louis Pasteur, Marie Curie, or James Watson and Francis Crick? In 1953, it was Watson and Crick who described the structure of DNA as a double helix. So you hear a lot about DNA evidence used in crime investigations. And when people are accused of crimes in the U.S., they have rights under criminal due process. That's not the case with dogs. A legal expert says they're considered property. So DNA testing when an animal is accused of killing another one isn't part of their legal process. Still, the owners of Jeb, a service dog that helps care for an elderly man in Michigan, spent $416 to obtain DNA evidence and prove Jeb's innocence when he was found standing over the body of a neighbor's dog. The rest is now canine courtroom history. Jeb, you were accused of a very serious crime. Did you do it? When you heard Jeb killed another dog, what went through your head? No, Jeb didn't do it. At the end of the trial, what was the judge's order? That Jeb needs to be put down because he's a dangerous dog. He had his mind made up that that dog needs to die. When it came back, what did it say? It said that Jeb did not kill the dog. His DNA was nowhere on any of the samples. If you had not gotten that DNA, would Jeb have been killed? Yes, certainly he would. There was no question about it. How did your husband respond when Jeb came home? He was in shock. He cried. No. Oh. So he was happy. so happy. You're a good doggy. Well, they say that no two of these things are exactly alike. And these pictures prove it, at least in the close-up snowflakes captured by this CNN eye reporter. He says the pictures were taken by a smartphone with a lens attachment. There are particles that fell out of the Ohio winter sky and stuck to the windshield of a parked car. The photographer says he's been taking pictures like this for three years, and though some people might ask why, to us it's crystal clear. Seeing snow chilling on his car precipitated the idea, and he probably thought to himself, let us take a closer look. As a matter of fractal, who'd want to flake out on the chance to branch out and capture some frozen flaketography? Like these puns themselves, the picture is just kind of snowball. I'm Carl Azuz, hoping you have a great weekend, a sled of you. Hey guys, if you want to get active on my channel, if you want to get that latest stuff, if you want to get the latest blog posts, then click or tap the subscribe button right up here. You can also check out my website for the latest posts right down here. And you can view a random video for yourself right over here. Also, I encourage you guys to check out the description down below.